Hear the word of the Lord. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who need no repentance. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As most of you know, our youth mission team returned home from a mission trip to Rockport, Texas about a week ago. The mission trip has a few goals each year. The first is simple, really. We just want to rebuild a few homes to help some folks who need the help very badly. And we'll talk about why they needed it in just a moment. The second goal is to provide some space in the youth's calendars, in their lives, for them to come together with their Christian community and build and bond that community. These youth care about each other, and the mission trip provides them a chance to build a lasting friendship with their friends at church, uh, to build mentoring relationships with the youth leaders. And finally, and this is far from an afterthought, so finally and most importantly, we hope to spread God's love, to share that love by representing God's church and showing kindness and compassion offering hard work and hope to folks who really need it. And by doing so, we hope we can share a little bit of the character and nature of God's love, even in the face of dire circumstances. And that love of God is not only the reason we go, but it's the focus of this morning's sermon. But let's back up a moment before getting there. I promised we would reflect on the mission work, on why these folks in Rockport, Texas needed help. This is Hurricane Harvey in 2017. Many of you will remember it from the news and the tremendous flooding it brought to Houston. Houston, of course, received most of the national attention because of the size of the city. But Houston is a ways inland, as you can see, or a ways north from where the, uh, where the hurricane first hit. And the point where Harvey made landfall is a little town called Rockport, Texas. That's it on the screen. And the eye of the hurricane made landfall in Rockport. So this is sort of ground zero. And it left Rockport in pieces. Buildings were toppled, roofs were ripped off, boats and marinas were completely wiped out. Severe wind damage to be followed by major water damage. And this storm did not discriminate. Many residents were left homeless, from the wealthy to the poor. No matter your race or your creed or your background, the storm wiped out much of the town and many of these homeowners have been without homes or living in severely damaged homes for two years now. Can you imagine being out of your home for two years? While there was a great outpouring of help for Houston, which received so much attention nationally, less help came to little old Rockport. It was the community residents themselves who did much of the rebuilding with just a bit of help from outside folks. So enter our youth mission team. These were our t-shirts this year. 
For those who maybe can't see the screen clearly, we have Jesus over there on your right, and he is reaching for a sheep. And there's a cowboy riding in, and in my mind, maybe that's us, and we're trying to lasso the sheep. It is unclear why we are lassoing the sheep. (laughs) And I loved it when folks from other groups asked me, what's the cowboy doing? I just looked at them knowingly and laughed and said, oh, you know. (laughs) And then I just walked away. (laughs) So it's unclear. We may be stealing the sheep, hog tying the sheep for fun. I don't know. But down below it says FPCHS Youth Mission, not our first rodeo. Not our first rodeo, and it wasn't. Meg Kilcoyne has been on 15 of these mission trips in a row. And I've been on 14, Carol Stevens over 10, and on down the line with our leaders. We only had one rookie student, Leah Kaiola, and so most of our youth were also veterans to mission trips. No, this was not our first rodeo. So you'd think with all this experience, Maybe these things would be easy now. Piece of cake, right? This is old hat, a well-oiled machine, second nature. It must be easy. Well, the problem is, as the leaders have gained so much experience, we've also gotten older. (laughs) Except me, of course. I don't age. But No, of course I do age. And I never feel it more than on these trips. So this didn't feel like my first rodeo or my 14th. By the end of the week, it probably felt like my 30th rodeo. Keeping up with the youth, even youth as wonderful as ours, it's a little tiring. But the youth were amazing. Oh, Hamilton, you would have been so proud. You should be so proud. Our youth represented our congregation and the God they love with integrity, enthusiasm, hard work, bright faces, and of course, love. We were on two sites for the week, one where we were building a new ramp for a disabled man so that he could exit his home in safety. Over 40 feet of ramp was needed. And our students not only brought that project to near completion, and by the way, another group completed it this week, but they also tended to the man's yard, doing weeding and landscaping to the property, taking care of whatever needed to be done around the house and property. And at the second home, we were putting new drywall up on a ceiling that was damaged during the hurricane and had allowed water, outside air, bugs, and Lord knows what else to invade this house for over two years. And of course, the room wasn't square, so pieces of drywall had to be cut into large pieces, but then cut to very strange angles, all the while being held up by our youth while standing on ladders. Our youth worked hard, Despite the 90 plus degree heat and extreme humidity, they showed kindness to the homeowners when the homeowners were around. They were a blessing to the community. The neighbors saw them working as they drove by. And on the last day, we headed to the beach because if you work together, you ought to also Sabbath together. We quickly found out we were outnumbered by the jellyfish in Texas and so decided a pool was maybe a better idea. We enjoyed some real Texas barbecue, some as authentic as it gets Mexican food, and then we journeyed home. A great trip, no major injuries, great behavior by our youth, group bonding, it was a beautiful thing. And in the evenings, we had worship every night. Our own group's focus for the week was on the parables of Jesus from Luke chapter 15. 
and as fate or the spirit would have it, a song that we sang in worship almost every night and that we will sing later in this morning's worship service, used imagery from one of these parables. And it's our parable for this morning. So let's think about the parable together. Some religious types are grumbling about the fact that Jesus is hanging with tax collectors and sinners. And so Jesus tells this parable. Who among you, if you have a hundred sheep, doesn't leave the 99 to go find the lost sheep when it strays? And when you find the lost sheep, you put it on your shoulders and you rejoice. And just so, there is much more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 persons who are not in need of repentance. This is a strange teaching, isn't it? Especially for a mission trip. But one, if we're honest, we are glad to hear. And what an ending. The shepherd finds the sheep, and there's much rejoicing by the shepherd and all the angels in heaven. This is a happy parable. Because we know ourselves well enough to know that many times in our lives we are that lost sheep, the one who is strayed, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. That's the way our first hymn put it this morning. We are prone to wander, but we get that climactic happy ending. So we like this parable. So I got to be honest with you, a marriage between two ministers is a little weird. As you can imagine, our dinner conversations are, well, most people would be very bored, but we love it. It works for Taylor and I. So my favorite thing in the world is to make Taylor laugh, of course. And so I have developed a series that I call the anticlimactic parables. And these are parables that play off of a parable of Jesus, but maybe have a twist at the end. Not a twist that makes it more climactic, but much less. I'll give you an example. There was a shepherd who had a hundred sheep. One of the sheep strayed away. So, of course, the shepherd immediately left the 99 to go find the one. And while he was off looking for the one, it found its way back to the flock. <laughs> and when he came back later, he said, oh, there you are. <laughs> Doesn't have the same punch as Jesus' version, does it? We don't feel as good after that one, but... It makes Taylor laugh, so it makes me happy. <laughs> I've got about 30 of them. I'll unveil them slowly in coming months. But the seeming simplicity of the actual parable that Jesus tells, combined with the happy ending within it, might leave us missing the point. And the point of the parable, I think, is not only the wildest piece of the whole thing, but it is also the reason that the parable, which seems to be a parable about repentance and not judging those who need to repent, or perhaps maybe evangelism, it's why I actually think this parable is a great one to focus on and one that I chose to focus on for a mission trip, for devotions, for a song, even a t-shirt. You see, shepherds in that day, their primary function was not simply to lead the sheep around. They were mostly there to protect the sheep, to keep them safe, to keep them alive. Yes, leading them to food and to water was certainly necessary and a big part of keeping them alive. But much of what the shepherd did was fend off danger, help keep the sheep out of bad situations. So this danger could have been a predator in the wild. It could have been a storm that rolled in very suddenly. It could have been thieves who wished to steal the sheep. 
or someone out in the wilderness who was looking for a quick meal. It could just be the sheep accidentally wandering into a situation near a, near a cliff or a precipice that might be dangerous for them. The shepherd protected all the sheep. That was his job, her job. After all, sheep were a business. And whether the shepherds owned them or not, and more than likely they did not, they were shepherding for a wealthier family that actually owned the sheep. The sheep are only good to the owner alive. They aren't any good if they're killed for a meal by a predator, or stolen by a rival business or random thieves, or starved in the wilderness or dead at the bottom of a cliff. The sheep, all the sheep, need to be alive. And so Jesus' question is actually rhetorical, but maybe not in the way we think. Who among you, if you have a hundred sheep and one wanders away, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness to go find the one? Who among you? Well, none of us would do that, Jesus. That's crazy. Our employers would kill us. Leave 99 sheep unprotected in the wilderness to go find one? That's crazy. The owner will be mad enough that we lost one sheep. We can't risk losing the 99. That's absolutely crazy, Jesus. No one, no one would leave the 99. No one. And Jesus' response, God would. God would. And God does. It seems Jesus would make a terrible small business owner. But he makes a wonderful God. Forget the prophets. I need the one who strayed. Because God isn't in it for the business, he loves the sheep, knows each one by name, and wants every one of them for himself. And if that means getting a little reckless with his love, then God is up for it. God is ready to be reckless. And so while one interpretation of the parable is certainly that we are sinners in need of repentance, that's not the only interpretation. And while another interpretation is that we ought not judge sinners and tax collectors and those prone to wander, because while we're sitting here judging, the heavens are pursuing and rejoicing, while that's surely an important interpretation of this parable, it's not the only one. A good and fair interpretation of this parable might also suggest that God is reckless with his love going against conventional wisdom and smart business sense, not worried about budgets and profits and bottom lines, not worried about the worldly wisdom of it all. God leaves the 99 because that one is so important. A reckless love. And while this is good news for us, it better also be a wake-up call. Because if God isn't measured and calculated, and cautious, and worried, and careful with his love, then I don't think we ought to be either. Budgets and planning, these things have their place. And yes, a church is a small business of sorts. And yes, our own calendars and vacation times and everything else going on in our lives factor into what we can do but we better still be willing to be reckless. To see a need or an opportunity to give, to see a ministry that we didn't think we could do, and say, and not say, what can I afford, or what do I have time for, or what could I really do here? But to leave the 99 and jump in and say, let's see. Let's see what I can do here. Let's see what we can do here. Serving a God of reckless love is a call 
to love recklessly. There's no other way to see it. Our youth did that in Rockport, Texas, and I couldn't be prouder of them. They gave up a week of their summer. They gave up so many other things that they could be doing. So many of them seniors, their last summer at home before leaving home. But they didn't think about their calendars, their schedules, what they would rather be doing, what they could be doing. They just said, let's see. Let's see what happens when we love recklessly. And so we wore a shirt. Maybe that shirt isn't nonsense after all. Some big joke. Maybe it's Jesus. After leaving the 99, pursuing that one sheep recklessly. Loving it recklessly. And maybe that cowboy, cowgirl, is meant to be us. Doing our part to recklessly love also. To leave the 99 and chase after the one. Whether it's building a home, sharing the good news, giving to your church or your charity, or just plain brightening someone's day. Maybe that's meant to be us. So how about it, Hamilton Square? You got any cowboy in you? You got any reckless love? Amen.